Hey guys, this is your host, Doug Stewart. And if you have been with us since episode one, I want to thank you for hanging in there with us and being a loyal supporter and a loyal listener. We have so many episodes. I mean, we're in the mid to high 300s right now, depending on which episode you're listening to this little pre-roll for. What we're going to do is we're going to actually re-release a few of the episodes that I would consider maybe our greatest hits, ones that Maybe you haven't listened to in a long time because you've been here with us from the beginning, or maybe you haven't actually been here for that long and you haven't had time to go back and re-listen to some of them. So we're going to reissue some of the episodes that were really, really, I'm going to call them old as in like they were recorded a long time ago, but they're not old in terms of relevancy. And so you will hear from me as host. You'll also hear from probably Norman Horn as host. We might even have some other special guest hosts, depending on what the topic is. So to be sure, we will also be releasing new episodes. But we also wanted to return to some of the classics that we've had. So I'll let you get to the show. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I'm Doug Stewart, and today our guest is Russ Roberts. Russ is an economist with Stanford University's Hoover Institution and is the well-known host of the podcast Econ Talk. But he is also the co-creator of the popular Keynes Hayek rap video, author of several books, including How Adam Smith Can Change Your Life. And more recently, he published a visually stunning online poem, A Wonderful Loaf. Russ, thanks for being on our podcast. My pleasure, Doug. I wanted to have you on because you've recorded, what you say, over 600 episodes with a variety of guests, right? Yep. You undoubtedly have come across people with differing opinions from not only each other, but from your own. And you have demonstrated over a decade, more than a decade, that you you can be gracious and you can play fair and give the benefit of the doubt. And it seems that you had these habits of interviewing people and talking with people that would go far for for anybody, but especially libertarians, because we tend to be a slightly combative bunch, especially because we tend to have high opinions. And so you're just really gracious, even when your guests seem to be a little bit riled up about, you know, your disagreements, if you bring them up. And this episode is launching the week of Thanksgiving 2017. And a lot of people are going to be getting together over the holidays, whether they actually talk about controversial things this week and through the next month or so, or whether they're just with people who they know they disagree and they're just going to, you know, leave it alone. We all can benefit from what it takes to have conversations that are meaningful So what is it that you've learned over the years as a podcast host and, well, as a human being? And how have you developed the habit of having meaningful conversations with others? That's a tough question, but a really important one. And I love the idea of trying to answer it. I have to confess, and this sounds like false modesty, but it's not. I have to confess that it's something I'm not particularly good at. And it always makes me happy that people think I'm gracious and respectful on the air. Because inside, I get angry like everybody else, and I have many, many bouts of self-righteousness, like we all do. And I've spent, it's taken me a long, long time to get better at it. If you saw me or listened to me when I was in my 20s or 30s, I was arrogant and self-righteous and dismissive of people who didn't agree with me. And as I've gotten older, I'm I'm ashamed of that behavior. I know it's partly related to youth, but I'm ashamed of it. I wish I'd acted differently. And so I've worked very hard to be calmer and more respectful of people I don't agree with when I'm interacting with them, at least. It's not easy. It requires some serious behavior modification when we talk about what what that might be. But just as an aside, when I speak publicly, sometimes people will come up to me and say, boy, you're really different than you are on Econ Talk. And that's because I'm passionate and I'm intense and I speak strongly about certain things. And on Econ Talk, I try to be calmer and more circumspect and humbler. And it's a hat I wanted to put on. I think it's important partly because, as you point out, I'm a libertarian. I don't think it's just because we have strong opinions. We're also a little bit embattled. We're a small minority that tends to both attract people who are a little bit different than the average person in my experience. And after a while, it kind of wears you down. Most people don't necessarily respect how you feel. And so I think it's especially important for those of us who are libertarian or any minority position to represent our views respectfully and treat the people we disagree with respectfully. 
first of all, I think it's very good advice for encouraging people who might come over to our side. And secondly, I think it's just part of being a good human being. So for me, it's taken me, as I said, a long time. There are many times I wanted to respond angrily to guests over things they said about their opinions, but also things they say about me sometimes. <laughs> you know, sometimes they're not so respectful to me, not just my opinions. And I try not to answer in kind. And I take that same attitude pretty much out into everything I do, or at least I try to. I don't always succeed, of course. So when I'm on Twitter, I try not to make snide remarks. I try not to make ad hominem personal attacks on the people. And in particular, when I answer emails from strangers who sometimes say really nasty things, I try not to respond in kind. So one way to help think about this is that it's very rewarding, both as a character formation experience, but also in the response you get from other people. There's a drawback. You don't get as much tension, I think, when you're calm. I think the shows and programs that have lots of yelling tend to attract bigger audiences. So that's the drawback. The plus is you are doing something virtuous. There's nothing virtuous about anger. I think passion is is a virtue, but I don't think anger is a virtue. I don't think it's particularly healthy. I think you can literally work yourself up into a state. And I think that's very destructive of your mental control. And so I've come to receive pleasure and to feel satisfaction from not yelling back, either in emails or on Twitter or when I'm interviewing people or when I'm face-to-face at the dinner table. I think it's strictly hard at the dinner table because you're with people you like, whose respect you kind of count on. And when you feel like they're not respecting your views, which usually just means they don't agree with you. That's the way we usually right. uh, ex- deal with that. Uh, it, we have an emotional, ego-driven, I do anyway, uh, response. And so what I've tried to do over the years is to observe that, watch that it's happening, and try to be more thoughtful in how I respond. Don't always succeed. And I'd say I've, I'm much better with strangers people I'm interviewing or I don't know personally than I am with, say, family members. I think family members are especially challenging around this time of year. So uh, I salute your efforts to make Thanksgiving more civil. Yeah, well, you know, I think the past year seems to, maybe this isn't the case, but it seems to be that the last year has become more polarized in our country. And maybe that's just my experience online. But man, I mean, there are hardcore supporters you know, hardcore adamantly against the president or particular parties and so forth. You know, you almost don't know how to have a conversation about topics that even just nibble at the edges of those issues, whether it's, you know, things like immigration or foreign policy or what are we doing about North Korea or any of the hot button topics, like everything is volatile nowadays. Here's a lot of yelling. I feel like the volume's a lot louder. I feel like there's a lot less respect for people the opposite side. I think people feel perhaps correctly, that there's a lot more at stake. I think both Trump supporters and Trump antagonists feel like the country is on the verge of disaster if one or a few other things, if you have a few things go wrong. And so therefore, they have to support Trump or they have to oppose Trump. And I, it's tempting because of Trump's personality to view him as the source of the problem. I'm not sure that's true. And there is a temptation to over-exaggerate it, but I've I've been politically aware since the late 1960s, right? So I have a lot of data in my experience. And and there was incredible hatred of Richard Nixon, incredible hatred of Bill Clinton, incredible hatred of George Bush, incredible hatred of Obama. So in a way, Trump's just like the perfect weather vane for this part of our nature that is tribal. I think of it as a rise in tribalism. I feel like some of it may be, it's tempting to, to attribute it to a loss of religious faith and the substitution of another religion. I'm very, I think a lot about David Foster Wallace's quote. He says, everyone worships. It's just right. a question of what you worship. And mm-hmm. so there's a lot of worshiping going on. You know, the, I'm a religious Jew. And I think the word religious for a lot of people, not for me, but for a lot of people is an insult. If you're not a believer, it's an insult. But I, I think trying to take it a sociological direction Here's how I would describe it. I think a lot of people have ideological or religious views that are not subject to test or confirmation. They're just accepted by each bias as our views. Almost nothing will dislodge those views. So my Judaism, your Christianity, someone else's atheism, those aren't rationally arrived at. Careful study the way we would say 
decide how to buy a car. And you and I, if we decide to buy a car, we, we look at, we're going to have a family. We have, are we married? Are we single? Do we have kids? If so, how many? And we buy a car accordingly. So I used to have a minivan. Now I have one kid at home. We don't have a minivan anymore. We have a Ford Escape and Honda Accord. And we have a different set of cars than we had when we had four kids at home. And when we bought a car, we went, looked at reviews. We asked people about their experience. We test drove them for a while. We don't come to our political views that way. We don't come to our religious views that way. They are very, very, I would call them emotional. That's somewhat misleading. Uh, but they're not, they're not the result of careful study and scientific analysis. And we, in, we inherit them also. A lot. A lot of parents, do. from our family. And, or we reject them for the same reasons, right? You know, my father smoked cigarettes. I've never had a cigarette in my mouth of any kind because I found it awful and disgusting and I, it was shameful to me. So people say, well, your parents are your role models. But a lot of times, they're your anti-role models. You, you, for what, and I'm very close to my, my parents, by the way. It's not like we didn't get along. We have lots of things that I, that I adopted from them. But some things we go the other direction. And so some people stay with the religion of their parents because they're their parents and other people just totally reject it. And that's true for political views. It's true for so-called, you know, actual religion. Uh, but my point about religion is, is that to me, a religion is something that is part of your core identity that is not amenable to uh, much factual uh, testing. And I don't say that, that's not an insult. Uh, I don't mean to insult, you know, religious people. Again, I'm one or people who are not religious, but adopt what I'm calling a religious view toward their, uh, ideological perspective, I'm suggesting it's a uh, part of our nature. And I would just add, just to make it clear, it doesn't mean you don't ever change it. It doesn't mean it isn't, there isn't some role for evidence or facts. Uh, I think a lot of people reject religion or accept religion based on their personal experiences, and that can change. Obviously, it's not, um, it's not immutable, but it's not the way we think of it when we think of it in an abstract way. And that's perspective you know, I picked up from uh, Nassim Taleb and Jonathan Haidt and others who, uh, and really the pragmatists in philosophy who suggest that reason is not as powerful as we like to think it is. So when we're in the, now to come back to where we were, when we have this, what I would call tribal or religious view, there's, there's an us versus them uh, national response. Our side's good. We've got the good studies. We've got the good viewpoint. We're out to help people. And that means by almost by definition, the other side must have bad studies and they must be out to hurt people. And I think when you start to realize that that's not true, that the other side, whether they're a different religion, whether they're atheists, whether they're religious, whether they're left, right, that many of them are decent human beings, um, changes your perspective. It should change your perspective. It should make you less confident. It should make you more open, more humble. And I, so coming back to our question about Thanksgiving and how to get along with people, uh, you know, when you, when you realize that your parents uh, changed your diapers for years, maybe that will cause you not to yell at them when they say, say something pro or anti-Trump uh, at Thanksgiving. It's a good thing to remember, hard to remember in the heat of the moment that they took care of you uh, for years, uh, but it's a good thing to remember. And finally, the last point I'd make is that it feels more tribal and one of the today than it was, say, 25 years ago. And part of that is we have more outlets for our tribalism. So one possibility is it's just that, well, we have Twitter and Twitter fools you into thinking the world's more tribal or Facebook. Uh, the other possibility is it actually is more tribal because you've created this sort of echo chamber of people you follow or people you friend who are a lot like you. And every day is like hanging out at the bar, uh, watching your favorite sports team. Yeah, every call that goes against your team, obviously the refs you know, hates your team. The good guys are winning or losing every, you're getting all this constant reinforcement. And I just, I think that's not so healthy. I think it was probably about half a decade ago that I started realizing that the other side, however that's defined by anybody listening to this episode, is <laughs> is probably more virtuous than you give them credit for. Uh, of course, there are truly, pe truly people who we just would despise if we got to know them. And, and yep. but, but those aren't probably the people at the level of running academic studies and... and or at your Thanksgiving table. Right, or yes, or at our Thanksgiving, <laughs> that's true. Most people are not evil. They're right, not. most people, they really are. Most people may, are not evil. They feel evil to you when you're in the middle of the, the argument, but you know, they're not. They're just finding, they're like you, they're trying to 
organized our thinking about a complex problem with limited knowledge. That's really what it's all about. And uh, they're doing the best they can like you are. And you could be wrong, just like they could be wrong. They yeah. could both be wrong. How do you get to the place where you can admit that you're wrong? Like that's that's a hard thing to swallow, especially when you're when you're in the heat of the moment. Yeah, so one of my favorite phrases is I don't know. It's not a phrase that I said a lot when I was younger, as I suggested earlier. You know, most of us, when we're, when we're forced to answer a question we don't know the answer to, we'll cook up something. We'll exaggerate the date a little bit. Um, and this is a side note, but I think it's actually pretty important. So we're, you and I are having a conversation right now. I'm not trying to win. We're just trying to explore some ideas that we happen to probably share them, which helps us, right? So we're having a very civil conversation right now. Uh, but a lot of times you could be having that conversation and all of a sudden it subtly switches to what I call debate mode, where the goal is to win, the goal is to score points. The goal is to humiliate your opponent sometimes where they'll be on the defensive and won't be able to make good arguments and the other people listening will sympathize with you. And so I think a lot of times we go into that I think the internet has a lot more debate than conversation. Part of that's because the format is short. You and I are going to chat for a while. We can go back and forth. You can press me. I can, I can back off a little bit. If I made a claim, I, I think is too strong. But when you're in that other setting, it's very hard to say, you know, I may have overstated that when I claimed that thing I did. And I think that when people are out in the, in the world, I find that extremely interesting how unwilling people are to say I made a mistake. I, I just... I just think that's a huge, huge thing to be willing to uh, say you're wrong. And, and, and to get there, you have to see yourself as having a conversation rather than a debate. So in my experience, debates are really, are extremely entertaining. And you can find lots of them online uh, between two people on the opposite sides of an issue where they're fireworks, we call it. And fireworks are pretty. They're fun to watch. You know, their intellectual fireworks are entertaining. But I don't think you learn so much from a debate. I think you learn from a conversation where you can see where the nuance is and where you can see where people are willing to back off or be more aggressive in, in a claim. And you know, just for an example, in a conversation, just casual conversation, when someone makes a, a bold claim, and sometimes they're just showing off, they're trying to show that they've been reading something. Or, and if you say, are you sure? They'll immediately back up. Well, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, because because they realize I, I don't. I'm not sure. Yeah, but you sounded like you were sure when you said it. In fact, you said it like a fact. You know, like like a fact. Like Annapolis is the capital of Maryland. <laughs> That's a fact. How confident are you? hundred percent. You know, well, not a hundred. I guess there's a chance that while we've been having the conversation, and I'm not following Twitter, the Maryland legislature moved the capital of Maryland to uh, Gaithersburg. Right? It's possible. But it's 99.999, or better way to say it, how confident are you that Annapolis was the capital of, of Maryland yesterday? That I'm very confident. I'd go to 100 on that. Right. But if you say, you know, what's happened to uh, wages in the United States over the last 20 years, or what ha what's happened to male-female differences in compensation, or uh, does the minimum wage discourage employment? You, you, you can go through a huge range of, I'm just picking economics, you can pick anything else. And, and people say things with such a, with such certainty. You know, even I'll, I'll pick one that doesn't have much baggage for most people. The steroid era really had a huge impact on home runs and distorted baseball statistics. I quote, everyone knows that, right? Um, but if I, if I counter back and I say, well, you know, George Foster had 50 home runs one year and I think it was the 70s and he never had another year close to that and nobody was using steroids back then as far as we know. Now, if you push back and said, you sure he had 50 home runs? Actually, that one I know. I'm pretty good about that. But a lot, I'm pretty confident about that. But a lot of times people will blurt out a piece of data or supporting evidence. And they really, it's really a vague, uh, sometimes it's literally misremembered. It's just wrong. Uh, and when you press them on it, a lot of times they'll, they'll be honest. They'll say, eh, I'm not so sure. So anyway, just an interesting way to think about it. I think, think about conversation. Don't think about debate. Put yourself in... Uh, conversational mode. Put yourself in the, in the shoes of, I'm trying to learn something here. I'm not trying to win. And it's very hard. Our natural impulse a lot of times is to try to win. But I think uh, it's very helpful to, to be cautious. You know, I came across an article the other day that said, uh, studies show that engage, uh, reading articles with opposing views does no harm. 
<laughs> and I don't know if it was a pair. I don't. I only read the headline. I don't know if it was a parody or if it was truly, you know, somebody did a study and that was the, you know, the clever headline. And you know, it's funny that you're talking about, you know, people quoting statistics, you know, off out of their memory or or their misremembered, you know, experience. Because uh, that's what I wanted to talk a, a little bit about next. You know, with Facebook and Twitter, we're able to post links to articles slash studies slash research slash probably not data. Uh, that supposedly confirms confirms our view that you know the you know right now it's all about the GOP's current tax reform bill that's yep. that's gone through and so people post an article and they're like see I'm yeah. right I'm yeah. right yeah <laughs> and so one of the things you know you're you're an economist you know how to work with statistics way more than probably most of our listeners definitely way more than me. I listened to a book on statistics uh, earlier this year that was like you know kind of statistics for everyone kind of thing, and I I got a lot out of it, but it doesn't it didn't prepare me to read statistics more. And so when you're at the level of you really just have to read the findings and what the media report on those findings, how do you? You know, I have the, the the person posting about why the GOP tax plan, and I'm not here to affirm it in any way, but it is horrible. And here's why, because of this study. And, and you know, I'm just like, well, I don't even have anything to, to, to go with that. Or, you know, to talk about something you just said, you know, has the minimum wage created a loss of jobs for the working poor? Or has the wealth disparity actually increased or decreased? And so we have books, we have so much data out there that I can't, I'm not an expert. I can't, you know, thumb through it and read through it. I don't have time for that. We have to rely on other people. And so it gives us the appearance that, ah, you know, some smart people that post on New York Times, Washington Post, they, they've got it right and they've digested it for us. And hey, look at that. A country with more guns is equal to more crime. And I mean, we can just pick anything really. And, oh, yeah. and it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I mean, there's very few things that are indisputable nowadays. I mean, there's... Seriously, flat Earth conventions. So, you know, it it it's so much out there. And so, I, let me boil it down to a question here for you: How do we keep our wits about us? This is a sea of opinions slash semi facts, and there are facts out there. I mean, there there's data out there that can help us. Yeah. Well, that's another big question. I I feel sorry sometimes for my wife because um, by living with me, when people say studies show, and then whatever comes after that, she has she like. She has trouble not laughing out loud because people say it as if that it's over. Like science has figured out that, you know, fill in the blank. And so one of the issues, of course, is that there are studies on both sides. That doesn't mean that, that you can't figure out what's true. But a lot of times uh, it means that, and this is hard for us to accept, a lot of times it means that the scientific method does not resolve this question. Uh, this comes back to the I don't know point, Right. There are a lot of things that I have views on. Uh, I think the minimum wage is bad for the poor. I have a lot of studies on my side, but I know the other side has studies on its side too. And they're done by decent people. Uh, and they're done pretty well. And they could be right. And so when, I, when I'm honest with myself, although I like to think that I have the good studies and they have the bad studies, I realize that the real reason I'm against the minimum wage is because of very fundamental principles about incentives. That it's not... A uh, scientific analysis. It's a logical, intuitive analysis that says when you make something more expensive, people try to get less of it, uh, buy less of it. So if you make workers more expensive, firms are going to try to hire fewer workers of that of the low-skilled kind. Now you can say, well, oh, you have no evidence. Well, I have a lot of evidence for it. I have the view that the observation that I think is undeniable that when you can ship stuff cheaply across the ocean, factories uh, will locate to where wages are lower to try to take advantage of that. They won't when it's expensive to ship stuff back to your home market, but they will uh, when it gets cheaper to transport. They'll move factories to Mexico when it's cheaper to get stuff from Mexico to the United States. And they'll try to take advantage of those lower wages and they'll shift to machines when workers, as workers get more expensive. We see lots of evidence that the firms care about profits and care about incentives and respond to them. So that's the real fundamental reason and I try to find that in the data. And I can find it. There's a lot of study, studies show that the minimum wage hurts the poorest of the poor the most. But I know there's studies on the other side. So now what do you do? Now you can say that my intuitive, casual, less scientific maybe evidence about incentives shouldn't be persuasive. You could embrace it and say, yeah, well, that makes sense to me. 
But the truth is, you don't know how big the magnitudes are. Even if I'm right, you don't know if it's an important phenomenon that when you raise the minimum wage, it discourages the employment of poor people. So you have to deal with that. You have to be realistic and say, I don't know with the level of certainty that I know that Annapolis is the capital of Maryland. And I think that's very hard to do. We don't like that. Uh, we we want to know the answer. I'll, I'll never forget, I was teaching in a business school once and I was talking about how, uh, I was saying something about S- Swedish socialism and something negative about it. I said something about, I don't know, it was, uh, maybe it was about Volvo. I think it was about Volvo. And, and, and they're, I said something negative about Volvo. That's that's the bottom line. And one of my students raised, I said, but we just heard from another teacher that Volvo was a great company because they are really good to their workers. So which is it? <laughs> that's like, we <laughs> all have black and white answer. It. <laughs> it's nuanced. There are some good things about Volvo and some bad things about Volvo. Uh, that was, that, that, that student didn't like that idea because he's waiting for that exam question. Volvo is A, a good company, B, a bad company. C, can't tell. The right answer is, it's complicated. D, there's no straightforward good or bad. Um, there are many, many ways to, me- to measure good or bad. And they're it just, anyway, so I, I think it's very hard for people to, to deal with life that way. We, all of us, I don't say people, me. I, I, w- I want to know the answer. I want to know, you know, I, I use the example of buying a car. What's the right car for me? What's the best car for me? You know, what's the best college for my, for me, says the says the 17-year-old. And, you know, people, that they don't get into the college they want, they burst into tears. You know, I always say, there's a lot of colleges that are going to be just fine for you. There's no best college. You made an effort to figure out what the best college was. And you were pretty sure it was whatever you thought it was, but you that's absurd. <laughs> you think about it. Right. But based on a couple trips to a few campuses and reading some books about it and talking to a few people who went there, you have no idea what you're going to be like in 10 years, five years, three years. I mean, just... Yeah. What's, in, what's important for them is is to say that they're the kind of person that cares about finding a good college and they're probably going to succeed wherever they find. <laughs> right. And, and and that's just very hard for us emotionally. So I think the, um, you know, you read the front page of the newspaper and it says broccoli cures cancer, broccoli reduces your risk of cancer, or broccoli causes cancer. And there's studies that show for dozens of foods and activities that they both reduce your risk of cancer and increase it. Okay, so what do I do now? And the answer is, well, you don't know. The answer is, those studies are not definitive. The answer is, probably just try not to eat too much of any one thing. That's all. I, that's what I get out of the literature on, on that, right? We don't know enough about the human body. And, and you can say, but, but, but I got to make a decision what to eat for lunch today. That's right. And you're going to have to do it with uncertainty because we don't know. It's just so, that's the reality. It's, we just don't want to hear that. It's the same thing with politics, same thing with religion, same thing with nutrition, same thing with health. We want to know the answer. And that's a, it's, a, it's actually dangerous. It's the problem. Because it convinces you that, that this study, I can finally find a good one. Or I can finally find the expert who I can trust. So whatever that expert says, that's the truth. And of course, every expert's wrong a good chunk of the time. And when you point that out on Twitter or Facebook, or Facebook, people go, they go ballistic. You know, they're going to defend them to the death. And I want to say, you know, they're not, they're not bringing down the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. It's just, it's not divine. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a person, a human being. You know, people say to me, you know, Hayek was in favor of national health insurance. And I'm not, okay? And I like Hayek. And I, say, I always say, well, one, it's a paragraph out of one book he wrote. Two, it's a different kind of health insurance then than it is now. Three, so what? <laughs> right. Hayek's not a saint. He's not a prophet. Yeah. I don't accept everything he said is true. Can't, you can't handle that? You can't imagine that I'm, you know, totally okay with saying, I think Hayek was wrong about that. Why, why is that so hard? Yeah. And the answer is because we want to we latch onto these things. Hey, folks, I just want to take a break from our episode to ask you to consider becoming an LCI insider. We want everyone to feel engaged and excited about what LCI is doing. And the best way to do that is if you become a monthly supporter at $20 or more per month, you will become what we're calling our LCI insiders. You get some free gifts. You get an exclusive Crisis King magnetic lapel pin. We give you two copies of Faith Seeking Freedom. We send monthly eBooks months ahead of when they're released on our public website. 
you can get discounts on our swag on our online store, and you get exclusive invites to our quarterly live streams with the LCI staff. In addition to that, whenever we do publish something like a physical book like Strangers with Candy, we'll also send you those as well. So the best way to stay up to date on what we're doing and to support what the Libertarian Christian Institute is doing, including supporting the podcast you're listening to right now, is to become an LCI insider. So to do that, go to libertarianchristians.com slash donate and then choose recurring monthly gift and you'll be added to our list automatically. Thank you for your support and I'll let you get back to the podcast. Well, I heard someone kind of accuse libertarians of misreading Hayek or selectively reading Hayek. And I thought, I was like, really? No, that can't be right. Because all the people who are pretty pretty big on Hayek don't align to that particular you know, method. Yeah. Or if they do, it's a very weak kind of like, well, maybe in certain circumstances, I'll accept something like that. You know, you, you say a lot on your, your podcast, you know, I'll take your point and you let something pass. I'm assuming you might be suppressing some, you know, passionate response or something. Sure. But you, what, what that communicates is, well, okay, even if you're right, let's, let's keep talking because that doesn't necessarily imply your, your ultimate conclusions. And so, you know, you could kind of let people give their opinion. You can say, okay, you might be right. I'm not going to die on that particular hill. But then other times people will bring up, and, and I've had a friend tell me this, and I say, well, you know what? I kind of asked him the question I asked you a little earlier, and, and he's far on the left. And he says, but the studies that are, you know, anti-minimum wage or show that, you know, immigration, you know, lots of immigration is a good thing, those are funded by people like the Koch brothers. Yeah. And, and they say that the, the incentive for those studies is, is kind of, you know, aimed in that direction or nudged in that direction and so forth. I mean, you know, he's I, right. So, however, yes, I want to hear your response everybody, about this. Everybody's got a conflict, right? It's not, sometimes it's money. Uh, you know, I'll, climate change is, a, is the best example of this. People say, oh, all, the, all, the, all the skeptics about climate change are funded by the oil industry, say. Well, it's not true, first of all. There are a lot of skeptics who are not funded by the oil industry. And of course, there are people who are worried about climate change also have a financial incentive to get grants and get other, other non-monetary forms of, of reward, such as a claim and publications and acceptance into the club. We all have our biases and ideologies. Yeah, but so, their survival is not dependent upon refuting climate change. They're, they, they're doing it because they have good intentions, Russ. Don't you realize that? Well, it could be. It, it, and, you know, I like to think it's true. I have a lot of friends who are very worried about climate change, and I, I am not as worried as they are. I'm a lukewarmer, meaning I think there'll be some uh, climate change, some of it's from humans, and I think we can cope with it pretty well. So I, maybe I'm wrong. Obviously, um, there's an interesting argument to be made that that it's such a high risk thing to play roll the dice with. I, I like to th I think that if it really turns out to be as bad as people think, we will have time to respond. But maybe you know maybe I'm being overly confident. I have to confess, part of the reason I don't want to respond to it is because I'm very skeptical and worried about the concentration of political power and a lot of the solutions either encourage or demand that we create either an, an international government or formats for the government to run our, our choices. And so I have, I have a lot of bias there I'm totally aware of and I, and, I'm, and, I could, and I could be wrong. But I don't think it's usually the case that in the case of the minimum wage, say that it's funded by people with a financial stake. Uh, the Koch brothers have no financial stake in the minimum wage issue uh, in any real way that I know of and certainly did not fund the dozens, literally dozens, maybe hundreds of studies in the 50s, 60s, and 70s that found that the minimum wage was bad for low-wage workers. So um, I, I, it's, a, it's an interesting point. You should always be careful about the incentives that face the people who do the studies. I think, that's, I think it's relevant. I wouldn't say it's irrelevant. At the same time, you do have to answer those studies with better ones if you think that they're flawed because they're biased. And so you'd have to show that the non-biased studies are better. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's relevant. It's not irrelevant. People do have a financial stake in um, holding certain opinions. But that's really the point I'm making about experts. That's why you shouldn't trust any expert, per se, as, as irrefutable or always right. Because they all have some stake in it. And sometimes it's just their reputation. They don't want to... It's very hard for people to change their views and come out publicly saying oh, all those things I said before were wrong. And so they, they lock on to their past views and are very inflexible. 
and they're much less likely to, to change them in response to, to new data or new, new information. So I think we should all be aware of that. Yeah, except holding things loosely doesn't seem to be as much fun as holding on yeah. to our opinions. That, That's right. What, let's talk about your, your book with Adam Smith, or with, <laughs> that was funny. Let's felt talk, that way. Yeah, <laughs> I bet it did. You know, I, I'm not a person who has read anything by Adam Smith other than, you know, maybe snippets online. Uh, you know, here and there, quotes from from other books. And you've done the job for someone like me who probably won't read him. And your book is How Adam Smith Can Change Your Life. And I, I've read it twice. And I have thoroughly enjoyed each time. I did. I listened to it. And the, the narrator was very good, did a very good job. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what Adam Smith says about, about life in Theory of Moral Sentiments? Yeah, so this is the book I wrote about his... Um, less famous book. His famous book is uh, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, which is just called, called by most people The Wealth of Nations. Very important book. Started the field of economics as in many ways. There were economics, there was economics writing before, but Smith, with this massive volume of really social science, started the world in many ways thinking about problems and in, in, in what we call social science ways the challenges of causation and what explains various things. So it's a very it's a very important book. But he wrote another book, which is very different, extremely different, called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, where he tries to explain why we do what we do in the moral sphere. Why we, where does our, where does our conscience come from? Why do we ever do the right thing, given that we're naturally self-interested, which we, I think, are. And it's a fascinating book. It is hard to read. So what I try to do in the book is to give people a uh, an entry into Smith's ideas and apply many of them to our modern situations. And none of those things have changed since 1759 when he wrote the book. We still care about what other people think of us. We still care about attention. We still care about money. All the things that Smith uh, actually warns us about. So Smith in a number of places, this is the literal quote, but he makes the same point else more than once. He says, man naturally desires not only to be loved, but to be lovely. So what he's saying in that very simple sentence, something very, I think, deep and profound, takes a little bit of unpacking, which is first naturally desires, meaning it's it's hardwired into us, it's part of our nature. We want to be loved, but not just loved, we want to be lovely. And by loved and lovely, he doesn't mean just in the romantic sense, so that would be included. He means, by loved, he meant paid attention to, praised, respected, honored. The idea that when you walk into a room, people notice you and, and think good thoughts about, oh, it's to your reputation. So he says, you want all those things. You want to be honored, praised, respected, adored, ideally loved. But more than that, you want to be worthy of those emotions. You want to be praiseworthy. You want to be a good person that earns the respect of the people around you, that earns the honor of the people outside of yourself, uh, of your family and your friends, and I, even maybe beyond. So Smith was saying that this is what drives us. This is what motivates us. This is what we want. And he says that there are two ways to be loved. There are two ways for people to pay attention to you. One is he calls the glittering path, and that's fame, fortune, and power. He says famous, rich, famous, powerful people, and the President of the United States would be the exemplar of that. When they walk into a room, everybody pays attention. I would say President Trump's maybe he's extraordinarily good at attracting attention to himself. We want to know what he's, people follow him on Twitter. And even before he was president, he was a person of interest to folks simply because he was rich and famous. Now that he's powerful, he's got the trifecta. Uh, the joke I use, I make in my book is that when I'm talking about lecturing on Adam Smith, which I do from time to time, and if, if Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie were to come into the room to learn about Smith and sit down off in a corner of the room taking notes, no one would be looking at me anymore. They'd all be looking at, at uh, Angelina because they are celebrities, they are rich, they are beautiful, they are famous, and everyone wants to just be in their presence. They want to look at them and they want to know what they wear and what they think. And that's a human impulse. And so because of that impulse to look at those people, Smith says, we pursue money, fame, and power, even though he says they're not going to really make us happy in themselves. Interesting thought for the first economist, what people would call the first economist. Again, he's not the first, but one of the first people to write systematically about economics. He says money's not everything. He says money, in fact, corrupts us if we're not careful. The pursuit of money for its own sake, it's not going to make us happy. It's going to make us do things that are shameful and, and unvirtuous. So he says the other way, the less dramatic and colorful way to be loved and lovely is to be wise and virtuous. And then... We don't get as quite as big a fan club as you do when you're Brad Pitt or Angelina Jolie or President of the United States or even a mere senator. Uh, but you're going to 
not do anything along the way to climb the ladder that'll be destructive. And you'll probably make the world a better place, which is not necessarily true of rich, powerful, famous people. And so Smith's a big fan of uh, the quieter path. Now, I know in my book, it's a little bit ironic. Smith was pretty financially comfortable by the end of his life through his books and through some government jobs he got, which is another irony, and through tutoring of rich people. So he was pretty rich. He was very famous, even in his lifetime. A lot of people had knew, knew of him. He was not very powerful. Although he was a customs inspector, he could, he could send your boat back, I guess, with the help of his other commissioners. My point is, is that Smith got a lot of the benefits of wealth and uh, fame, even though I don't think he pursued them particularly. I think he liked to read and think about things, and he liked his friends a lot. He wasn't trying to be rich and famous. It, that was just a side benefit. But for people who put that as their goal, Smith saying it's really not a healthy goal, and it's very hard to fight against those urges for money and power and fame. And Smith encourages us to do so. You said that you actually hadn't really read Smith until... Uh, more recently. Yeah, I hadn't read The Theory of Moral Sentiments. I went to graduate school in uh, the late 1970s. And when I was in graduate school, we had to read probably one chapter of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. I'd heard he'd written another book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, but I never really picked it up. I owned it, but I never really picked it up until I decided to do a, uh, a episode of Econ Talk with Dan Klein, who was my colleague at the time at George Mason University. And Dan uh, thought that would be fun. And I, we ended up doing a six-part series on just on the theory of moral sentiments. So if you want to understand the theory of moral sentiments, you read my book. You can listen to six hours of me and Dan Clyde talking about it. Uh, although Dan takes a very different perspective than I do. Dan's very uh, outside the box as a thinker. I learned a lot from him and have learned a lot from him. And so it's just a different approach. It's just, it's a rich book. It's a lot to talk about. You know, I've I've noticed that people who tend to be on the left end of the spectrum will quote a lot from the theory of moral sentiments as if as if Adam Smith endorses their policy implications. And um, you, you talk a little bit, I think, near the end of the book about why those two books are very different because he's talking about two different spheres of of life. Yeah, well, the left quotes the wealth of nations too. Um, they'll quote progressive income tax. Yeah, they'll argue it's Smith was in favor of progressive income tax. He was he was in favor of tariffs. He was in favor of government's funding of education. And they'll say, see, he wasn't a hardcore libertarian. And it's true, he wasn't. He wasn't an anarchist at all. He's what I call a classical liberal, uh, which is how I would describe myself, uh, or a libertarian. He, he thought there was an important role for government. He, he didn't want uh, anarchy, but all those quotes are typically taken out of context. The degree to which Smith was was in favor of tariffs or government funding of education or progressive taxation are all gross, grossly exaggerated. Uh, but I understand that the, the the appeal. It's like it's like me quoting Marx. I'm sure he says something nice about free markets somewhere in there, but in front of in Das Kapital, and then it's like my way of saying, "See, even your guy is is on my side." Right? Yeah. So I I get that, but but the point you're making about two different books is really interesting. You know, Smith. Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, tried to explain why countries get wealthy and others don't and why there's growth. And it's just bizarre because he was writing at a time when there was very little growth. There's a little bit, it was just starting what we'd call the Industrial Revolution or the modern period of growth. He, but he was interested in why some nations are richer than others, which there was still a big wealth gap in his time, even not before the growth of the 19th and 20th centuries. So that book, The Wealth of Nations, of course, he gets into a thousand other things along the way, but that book's trying to explain that. It's trying to explain how markets work and how people behave when they're buying and selling stuff. The theory of moral sentiments is about something else. The theory of moral sentiments is, what do I do when my friend's sick and I really don't want to go to the hospital? I hate hospitals and I've got a, something better to do. I want to watch the football game or, or my kid wants to help us with the homework and all I want to do is watch a TV show and all those small, but I argue quite large, moral decisions we make day to day, including ethical decisions we would call large temptations to be dishonest in, in, on the job and treat our the people around us unfairly or cruelly. Those, that's what that book's about. And and the standard view of, uh, of the book is that, of the two books, is that one of them, The Wealth of Nations, is about markets and the other is about our personal interactions with the friends and, and and acquaintances and family. And I think that's correct. But I, I think I get confused sometimes about what I say in my book and what other people have said and what I, what I think now. But I think my point is, is that I think it's true that it's two different spheres, but in, in all of them, I, in some dimensions, Smith's, there is some commonality. I think Smith's very interested in, in the incentives and how, what motivates us. And uh, the way I describe it sometimes is that 
and I, I learned this from Vernon Smith, my second favorite Smith, Nobel Prize winner. When I'm dealing with Amazon, I'm trying to find the best deal. But if I treat my spouse that way or my friends, like, oh, maybe I get my friend to pay for dinner two times in a row. Yeah, then I'll win. If that's our attitude, we're not going to have very many friends. And I think um, Smith understood that, that we ha we have to have different personas when we interact with relative strangers or actual strangers to say the internet or at a shopping mall or when I just uh, even go to my local, um, you know, my dry cleaner. I'm, I'm looking for the best deal. But when I'm in the game of, of personal friendship and personal interaction, I try to get the most out of it. Now, there are economists who've done that, who've modeled it that way, but I think I think the right way to think about our personal interactions is, uh, am I, and the way Smith thought about it, I should emphasize, is that am I playing by the rules? Am I being prudent? Am I being thoughtful? Am I being kind to the people around me? Am I stepping on their toes? I recently did an episode of Econ Talk with Mike Munger where we talked about this, this idea of, of the economy and certainly of our friendships as a dance. Now, when I'm out on the dance floor, I don't mind it. It'd be nice if I'm considered one of the better dancers out there. But if that's my goal when I'm out on the dance floor is to is to see how good I can look on the dance floor, I'm not going to be a very good dancer. And I'm not going to attract many dance partners. I'm not going to invite, invite to many parties. When I'm out on the dance floor, what I want to do is make sure I behave. I want to be proper. It means I don't step on my partner's toes. I want my partner to look good. And I don't want to step on the other dancers who are all around me when I'm throwing my partner around and you know twirls and, and swoops and whatever I'm capable of doing out on the dance floor. And I think that's a very good metaphor for how we interact with our friends. We have to make room for them. Just like I don't want all, half the dance floor to myself. I might want half the dance floor to myself if I'm a very acrobatic and physical dancer. But if it's crowded, I realize I can't. And so making room for other people, allowing other people autonomy, these are things that I think make us good husbands and wives, they make us good fathers and, and sons, mothers and daughters. And it's not, how do I get the most out of this? Now, when I'm on the on the internet, that's not a, it's not a horrible attitude as long as I don't deceive anybody. As long as, I, you know, trying to find a good deal is, is perfectly okay. But I have a different demeanor when I'm out in the, in, the, um, in the personal sphere, when I'm interacting with friends over the weekend or or I'm it's the dinner table. I don't just say, hey, I think I can get that last cookie. I want to make sure sometimes that my son gets it or my daughter or my wife. It's not all about me. And I think that's a huge, important perspective that Smith understands in, in the theory of moral sentiments. It's not as important in the wealth of nations. So he doesn't talk about it as much or at all, really. So I just want to ask, you know, one of the things that because you hold back a little bit or a lot, uh, depending on the episode in your own podcast, what are the things that you do get passionate about? You know, you you, you hold your tongue. Uh, what, what makes you angry or, or, or passionate? Well, again, I think they're two different things. I always find it amusing when somebody will email me and say, how could you let the guests say such and such? How'd you let them get away with that? I'm thinking, well, they didn't get away with it. You heard it. <laughs> and you can disagree with it without me telling you that I disagree with it. And a lot of times I let my listeners just make, come to their own decisions. I can't argue with... if I. If I interrupted my guests with everything I disagree with, it would be that much of an episode. It'd be mostly about me and not about the guests. Some of that's pure self-interest, right? If I want to have guests on my program who I don't agree with, I can't sandbag them and gotcha and, and try to humiliate them. I need them to come on because they're going to have a chance to share their views. So again, I try to react fairly calmly. I, I lose it. I mean, again, I think there's a big difference between passion and anger. I'm very passionate about free market ideas. I'm passionate about liberty but I don't have to get angry when people are on the other side of the fence for me or want to intervene in some government with some government program. or And I, I try to take solace to the fact that you know, government's grown dramatically during my lifetime and I have a very good life and my children will have a good life. I'm actually more worried about people who, you know, don't, don't grow up in a, in a household with books and who didn't get a good education and didn't go to a good school. And I, I actually, I look at the same way I look at the financial cronyism of our society it really angers me that Wall Street and investment banks have been taken care of by uh, public policy and and have allowed to have gotten bigger and and pay their people a lot of money. But unfortunately, it's also helped me <laughs> because it's increased the demand for economists. So I take comfort in those kind of things. I look at the size of government; it hasn't helped me helped me a little bit because it's subsidized education, and I'm an educator. It's helped a little bit there for me personally, but I think it mainly hurts people who aren't like me, and so. 
that I get passionate about that and I get angry about that. I get passionate, angry about state of our public school systems. Um, really frustrates me. But I get angry, so I think always, is almost never productive. The only time it's productive is if, if you're in danger. You know, anger and adrenaline are very useful if you have to lift a car off your uh, infant or uh, fight to the death. But that's not most of human existence, fortunately, in today's world. So uh, I really want to emphasize passion over anger and the importance of keeping passion from becoming anger. A lot of what you're saying today, Russ, is very valuable on a practical level and also one of those things that's practical on a, on a theoretical level. You know, the, whether, the, whether I win over the debate on minimum wage doesn't really affect me. Uh, it might affect me when my kids become teenagers um, and I might be a little bit more directly affected to some extent as, as their parent, but it doesn't affect me, whereas other things do affect me. You know, how, how I'm treated, how I treat others at Thanksgiving dinner, and and throughout the holidays that I you know am with friends and family, those those do affect me. And so a lot of the way that you're that you have described things, the things that you're describing, what Adam Smith says, are are very helpful for us. I just have one more uh, question. And sure, you talk about two companies on your podcast that end up inevitably being talked about at least almost every episode. So I want to ask if you had to choose to live in a world without either a Costco or an Uber, which would you have to? Which would you eliminate? <laughs> Uh, that's a cheap shot, Doug. I, I'm <laughs> confident they're not mentioned on almost every episode, but they do come up occasionally. Uh, and I think if you went back in the archives, uh, in a systematic way, you find Apple comes up uh, fairly often. It used to come up more in the early days. Uber's been very um, talked about on Econ Talk because I think it's such an important transformative uh, phenomenon and the potential for autonomous vehicles, driverless cars uh, as a socially transforming, life-affirming, ideally, uh, possibility to reduce accidents. And just, I think they're incredibly important. And they've forced people to think about the nature of employment, the role of, of technology. I it just, it's, so that's, I, that's my defense. Costco, I, I don't have a good defense for it, except that I find it in a fascinating business model because it's so, so different than a standard, say, grocery store, or department store. And it's... Um, it's it's just interesting, me. But uh, so if I had to do without one, uh, I think I'd right now I'd give up Costco because I really really like Uber when I'm traveling, and uh, I really find it incredibly helpful when I'm in a strange city uh, and not have to worry about renting a car uh, or when I need to get to the airport. It's just I really really like it, uh, and I really also think it's a wonderful thing for the drivers, even though they. There, a lot of people claim they're exploited. I think it's really valuable that they have options uh, that are flexible. And I, I almost always interview my Uber driver <laughs> and and find out how they find the experience, and whether it's gotten worse, whether it's gotten better, uh, what they've learned from it, what do they like about it, what do they not like about it. Just it's a part of life that's new and interesting. Costco, you know, actually. We do a lot of online ordering with Costco now. They deliver to us. So I don't get the thrill of the big box experience directly, which I find uh, just an interesting thing to wander through Costco. You can spend a lot of money there you, you wish you hadn't, either because of the size of the items or just the uh, impulse purchases. So you have to be careful when you're there. And uh, and I I don't like parking a lot. So parking, there's always almost always an adventure. So they being able to order online now has reduced some of the uh, visceral thrills and and dislikes I get from us. So I don't think about Costco as much. I think you'll notice it's gonna it's gonna go down in frequency of mention on Econ Talk. Well, I'm sure my question is conditioned by my selection of, of which episodes I <laughs> listen to first, and <laughs> no doubt. So yeah, my guest today has been Russ Roberts. Thanks for being with us, Russ. My pleasure, Doug. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you'd like to reach out to us and ask a question or submit some feedback, you can reach us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com as well as on Facebook, Twitter, and of course, our website, libertarianchristians.com. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. 
The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. Hello, everyone. It's Doug from the Libertarian Christian Podcast. You might notice already that this recording sounds quite a bit different from usual. In fact, it probably sounds pretty crappy. Well, I'm doing this to show you something pretty amazing. As you might know, the guys over at Podsworth Media have been producing my show for several years, quite a while, hundreds of episodes. And now they have a brand new online app for taking rough recordings like this one and making them sound a whole lot cleaner and a lot more listenable in just a few easy clicks. So here are some of the core features. They remove background noise. It reduces plosives, which is really handy for me because I often forget to put my pop filter on before I do a YouTube video. I often forget to put my pop filter on before I do a YouTube video because pop filters look terrible when you're on camera. It fixes clipping. It removes clicks and pops. It fixes clipping. It removes clicks and pops. It evenly levels dialogue so that you don't have somebody talking really quietly. And then somebody talking really loud because they're too close to the mic or too far away from the mic. It evenly levels dialogue so that you don't have somebody talking really quietly. And then somebody talking really loud because they're too close to the mic or too far away from the mic. How do you use it? It's easy. You go to podsworth.com. You click get started. And because you're a listener to one of the Libertarian Christian Institute's podcasts, you can get 50% off your first order by entering the promo code LCI50. That's LCI50 and you will get 50% off your first order. If you are doing anything like a podcast, a video, a sermon, an audiobook, anything that's spoken word, you want to use podsworth.com and clean up your audio to be even more professional and polished. You want to use podsworth.com and clean up your audio to be even more professional and polished.